Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, hello, California. My name is Sarah, and I'm an incredibly grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon and Alateen. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always an honor and a privilege to be of service. Um, And as I shared this morning at the end, uh, I I think you'll find through my journey that, um, you know, I'm the kid that uh, caused a lot of trouble and nobody wanted me around. So uh, almost 19 years later, to be asked to be of service halfway across the country is truly a miracle. And uh, so thank you for the invitation. And uh, Rosanna and I met at the World Service Conference. So um, that's one of the I'm I'm finished. Uh, December 31st will be my last day uh, as an active delegate. And then I will become a past. But uh, what I can tell you is uh, just getting a chance to meet Rosanna. Um, the World Service Conference is in great hands because you have a fantastic delegate. <laughs> So, uh, so my recovery journey began uh, January fourteenth, two thousand one, and uh, I was literally dragged through the doors of Alatine at sixteen years old, uh, and of course knew everything and had no desire to be there, and uh, and I'll get into that, but. Um, I, I, my story is going to be a little different tonight. I, uh, I do have some notes. I usually don't go off in notes. I'm, I feel a little discombobulated. We had a great workshop this morning. We went to lunch and, uh, and then I called my sponsor and spent the afternoon doing step work. Um, so that was good, I guess. Um, but, um, but it really kind of messed with me a little bit. So, uh, so I'm going to try to stick to my notes and not get too far uh, off my notes and uh, see what happens. But, you know, early in the rep- early in the in the program, uh, one of the first things that um, my first sponsor told me is that I suffered from cranial rectal inversion. <laughs> and um, and if you don't know, ask your neighbor. Um, they'll tell you what it is. But, you know, that that really was how I arrived here. I just was, uh, just, just, just pretty full of myself and, uh, lots of ego, which meant there was no room for a God of my understanding and, uh, no room for any guidance. And all that was because I was afraid. And the only thing I knew how to do was survive. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my childhood. Um, you know, I was in a meeting, uh, not that long ago and, they were talking about what's the normal. Really? It's a freaking setting on a dryer, right? <laughs> um, but but the normal in my house um, was the active disease of alcoholism. And I remember being a little bitty girl going to school thinking um, there was something wrong with everybody else because they didn't act like I acted. They didn't act like they were surviving the disease of alcoholism. I believed things like a messy house and fighting parents and cussing and my mom and dad throwing knives and fist fighting and, you know, saying cuss words and doing all those things. I truly believed that that was the normal. And those things in my home was a daily occurrence. Um, you know, my dad uh, is the is the person who I have a problem with his drinking. I used to say, uh, my dad's an alcoholic. I don't know if he's an alcoholic or not. And I don't have the right to really call him an alcoholic, but I can tell you I have a problem with his drinking. And I can tell you that his drinking caused a lot of harm in our family. Um, You know, I grew up um, not having really a relationship with my mom. I I always desired a relationship with my mom, um, but I always felt like she loved my little sisters more. And as I get into some of my amends, I'll... I'll share about that. But, you know, one of the greatest things that the program has given me is just the understanding that my mom did the very best she could with the tools that she had. What I couldn't understand at eight years old is that my mom was suffering from the disease of alcoholism. And as a little girl, all I could think is, why don't you love me? She loved me the best way she knew how. Um, so uh, so that's kind of uh, what my house looked like. And um, 
from the time I was a kid, I was looking for validation from everyone. I just wanted to be loved. I just wanted to be heard. I just wanted to be validated. And uh, if I didn't get any attention, I would seek attention. And so I spent uh, my early years in school. I actually was a pretty good kid. But uh, because of all that stuff going on in my home, that's what I learned. Uh, that's what I learned and that's how I behaved. And so by the time I was eight years old, things were so rocky in my home that um, we lived on this family compound and my grandma lived in the front of the property and my parents lived in the trailer in the back. And at eight years old, my mom said, you got to go. You got to go because uh, we had no relationship anymore. And um, at that point, there was I had one younger sister and then I had two younger sisters uh, later on. But my mom and I couldn't get along. And, you know, some of my earliest memories of my grandma um, through the inventory process, I found out that my grandma really was my first guardian angel. And I just didn't know it because I can remember being three and four years old wondering why I didn't feel safe. And I would walk down to my grandma's house and. And immediately when I walked through the door, I felt this unbelievable sense of safety before I could even identify it. Um, but so I moved in my grandma's at eight years old. And um, it's really, uh, you know, this this delusion uh, that we have in the disease of alcoholism and this denial, we don't even know we're lying. Um, we just don't know. And, you know, I, I made up the story at eight years old that I told people that I moved in with my grandma because my grandpa was dying. And don't you know, at eight years old, it's my job to take care of my dying grandpa and my grandma. And the and the reality is that's what was going on. But I expected people to believe it. I expect, expected people to believe that and not look at the fact that our family was drowning in the disease of alcoholism. You know, I grew up in a small a small a small country town where it was a town of 6,000 people. Everybody knew everybody. My dad uh, was a big wig at our local charcoal plant and there was lots of parties and uh, there was always parties on our property. And so everybody knew everybody, but I believe that I could, you know, just create this story and that would mask the reality of what was really going on. And um, I created stories that I thought would mask the reality of what was really going on for a lot of years right? The denial got so deep. And, and I really do love that acronym that says, don't even know I'm lying because it became so familiar. It became my reality. So, um, so at eight years old, I made a conscious decision when my mom kicked me out of my house. And that was, if you can't beat the disease of alcoholism, you might as well join it. And I never drank or did anything like that, but but I certainly started to practice the behaviors. And uh, at eight years old, my life changed at school. And uh, I would go to school and um, treat others the way that I was being treated at home. And the truth is, uh, I'm not sure I really knew that I was doing that. I knew that I made a conscious decision um, that I was um, going to survive. But, you know, when you're surviving in one place, uh, there's only so much uh, self-control you have at eight years old. And uh, so I carried that stuff over into my school life. And uh, sadly, uh, at eight years old, I uh, I became a bully. And, um, and that continued on for the rest of my journey in elementary school, middle school, and junior high. And uh, that's just what I knew to do, and I'm not going to stand here and make any excuses for it by any stretch of the imagination. That's all I knew how to do. Um, and what the steps have, has showed me over the years is I just was in a lot of pain. And the pain was so great for me to process the only way that I could deal with the pain is to hurt you. And uh, and that's what I did, and um, that was kind of what was modeled in, in my home. So, uh, so I learned to survive. Uh, I learned to fight. I learned to manipulate. Um, there wasn't uh, a lot of things that uh, I couldn't manipulate into making it be whatever it needed to be. Uh, as I got older, my sisters started to get a little older as well. And nobody asked me to do this, but I over time felt it was my role to protect them right? My grandma protected me and I felt like God had appointed me to protect them. And, uh, and so I really never had a childhood because I got busy. I got busy protecting my family from the disease of alcoholism. And, and honestly, it wasn't long and my grandma started to get sick. And, uh, so at 10 and 11 years old, I was writing checks, paying the bills, getting a ride to the grocery store, doing all the shopping, uh, and being like, uh, an adult 11 year old, 
Um, and, uh, I already had issues with my ego at like five. So at 11, when you're running a household, like, like you're, you're going to make it somewhere. Um, and so, and so that's what I did. Um, what I learned in surviving the disease is that I was always on guard to make a move, you know, trust. No, never could trust anybody. I just, that's just not what I learned. And I certainly didn't trust women. Uh, so you can imagine by the time I got here and I found out I was going to have a woman as a sponsor, that didn't go over too well. Um, but women just didn't seem safe. They just didn't seem safe. And uh, so um, so I loved my dad, though. And, uh, and I don't want to sound like I hated my mom. My mom did do the best she could, but I idolized my dad. Uh, I wanted him uh, to be in my life more than anything, and I was extremely active uh, in sports, sports was my out. Uh, from the time I can remember being like three or four years old, we collected baseball cards, me and my dad. And, uh, and, and we did that. Um, I mean, even after I left, I continued to collect baseball cards, but, but I was a softball player and I was really, really good. And so then I became a multi-sport athlete. And, um, uh, what eventually happened is as a result of, uh, me being affected by the disease of alcoholism and the inability to control my behavior, uh, sports became a distant reality by the time I got to high school. Um, but there was nothing more than I wanted for my dad to be at my games. And, you know, there was plenty of games where I hit a grand slam or, um, I spiked a ball in volleyball or, you know, basketball, I shot a three point and I'd look and my dad wasn't in the stands. And when you're a little kid, you just don't understand why, right? I just knew that he would show up, and I believed he would show up time after time after time. And uh, over time, I just started to take that really personally. You know, my dad never woke up in the morning and thought, I'm just going to screw my daughter today and not show up, right? But as a little kid, that's what I thought. Like, my dad doesn't love me. If he loves me, he would be here. He loved me. The only way he knew how to love me. Um, and what I know is when my dad got up and took a drink of alcohol, then that obsession and that compulsion took over and life changed for him. And, uh, and that's what happens in the disease of alcoholism. So, uh, so I made it through school and, uh, at least, uh, through like kindergarten. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I did make it through school. Um, I did struggle. I, I did play a lot of sports in junior high and, um, I lived in a rural school and, uh, it was a rural town and there was five rural schools in this town. And so that's who we, we would competitively play. Uh, it's just these five different towns and these people would come over from the other school, uh, in our town and, uh, I would continually get red cards and yellow cards. So that wasn't going well. Um, but, uh, in particular, there was this one school that had this one girl that I just really could not stand. I mean, I know that doesn't surprise any of you at this point. Um, I just, I could not stand her. And uh, every time we played that school, it was my mission to do something. Um, and uh, and so we just didn't like each other at all. And, um, you know, what I know is that this God of my understanding has a sense of humor because my first day, my freshman year, she's the first person I ran into. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but um, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, my grandma was always very religious. My, my great grandpa was a Pentecostal preacher. And I promise you, when you went into the church, it was hail, fire, and brimstones, and they were speaking in tongues, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. And, uh, my grandma was a Southern Baptist lady, and, you know, God was really, really important. And so from the time I was a little girl, I knew that God was important. But over the years, um, surviving in the disease of alcoholism, I thought, well, if God is really important and God is love, where is God? Right? And I spent a lifetime in the church. By the time I was a, uh, in junior high, I was like the state Bible drills champion. I could walk the walk, but I couldn't. I mean, I could talk the talk, but I couldn't walk the walk. I could do the things that the church was telling me, but there was an important thing missing, and that was a relationship with this God. The church never talked about a relationship. It just talked about just do these things. And I did those things. And then I wondered why God, I felt like God abandoned me. And if God was really love, why could all these things be happening in my family? And so let's get back to high school. I walk into high school my freshman year. I walk into the band room. Uh, one of the things that uh, I had really started to do was I started to be a drummer, right? Sports were good. 
uh, but I can hit the drums harder. And, um, and so I started to drum and, uh, and this girl that I used to meet up playing ball, uh, or whatever we were playing, she walked into the band room and, uh, and I had always been an aggressor. I had always won fights and we got into a fight and I lost for the first time in my life. And I thought I need her on my side, right? Like if I'm going to lose a fight now, we got to become friends. And, uh, and so we met and we really did. We become, uh, best friends, uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And, uh, what you'll here in just a second that was God doing for me what I can't do for myself one more time um you know my high school career kind of kind of went that way but now I had a partner in crime and uh um I you know I always t uh, tell people that if I'm going to go to jail it's going to be for homicide it's not going to be for suicide um and my friend uh actually was more self-harming than uh than others harming and so we somehow just became this pair uh pair and um what happened was is we started to spend a lot of time together and uh at this point boys were really important and i loved boys right because i idolized my dad and my dad wasn't available and so i become somewhat promiscuous at a young age and all i was looking for was this relationship with again somebody to love me and my grandma was progressively getting worse so um so she couldn't do for me what she used to do for me and um, and so I had kind of turned to boys and so that wasn't going too well. And I started to get into some trouble with that. But, but my best friend and I, we started to hang out all the time and we started to hang out at her parents' house. And you see my house, um, since it was still on the family compound, my mom had moved away, but over time, the dysfunction that used to be on the back side of the property had to come to the front side of the property because as the disease of alcoholism progresses, uh, it doesn't know geographics, right? I used to think if it would just stay back there, but it didn't. My house that used to be my safe place become unsafe. And so then I was too full of shame to bring my friends to my house because you just didn't know what was going to happen. I just didn't know what shoe was going to drop next. And so we, we, we always went to my friend's house and, and, and that was, there, that was God all over it because then my friend's mom got to act as watch, uh, got to watch us behave however we were behaving which i'm sure was extremely inappropriate and uh and she uh what i didn't know is that her mom was a member of al-anon and her dad was a member of alcoholics anonymous and so they started to tell us there was this dance right you all see where this is going and uh there was this dance and there was boys <laughs> dance eh, it was okay boys we're on. And, uh, and so we went to this dance. Um, I lived in Salem, Missouri, uh, which is in central Missouri. This dance was in Pacific. It was an hour and a half, uh, to get there. And, uh, and so we rode this long hour and a half and the boys were a freaking letdown. <laughs> And you can only imagine, I was extremely upset. Um, and, and and on top of it, there was this meeting called Alateen, uh at this dance. We were totally tricked. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I initially was um, furious because I knew nothing about alcoholism. I knew nothing about Al-Anon. And as I shared earlier this morning, my idea of alcoholics was that skid row bomb that other books talk about. And I was extremely angry to think that a productive man like my dad could be considered an alcoholic. So uh, so what happened is um, they got sick of our behavior again and they took us back next month uh, to the dance and the boys didn't get any better. Um, and the meeting didn't get any better. Um, but over time, uh, they encouraged us to start attending a weekly meeting and uh and i didn't want any part of that the only thing that was attractive about that is that the bell rang at 306 we could get my purple dodge daytona and my meeting was 90 miles away <laughs> and so every thursday we could road trip and and what happened for me is i i met a woman and i promise you i hated women i hated women women weren't safe but i met a woman that uh i hated even more than i hated my mom and uh and so um in all of my arrogance and ego i needed to show her something i don't know what i was going to show her but i needed to show her something and so i started to hang around and the truth is she was getting more attention than i was getting 
that's what that was about. And so I needed to figure out how to get that attention. And again, God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And so, um, so, uh, as I shared earlier, um, we coined the phrase alacrap. We didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, we started to go. And, uh, those of you that are involved in Al-Anon service or go to conventions or get in the car, you know what happens in the car. The miracles happen in the car. And what happened for me in that 90 miles is I would whine and complain. We would whine and complain together. Nobody wanted to go. I would, uh, I promise you, my first meeting, I beat somebody up and they told me to come back. I don't know what that was all about. And um, I really don't know what that was all about. Now, knowing what I know about Alateen today and my history, I would not, I don't know what I would do, but I don't know that I'd tell that kid to come back. We'd be having different conversations. But I was so taken back that somebody invited me back somewhere. Because by this point, everywhere I would go, they would tell my mom, don't bring her back here. They would tell my grandma, don't bring her back here. I uh, I had progressed so violently in sports that, um, you know, I, I love sports. But I was angry, and that was my only out. And I would hit the ball really, really hard, and I'd round second and slide into third and break the third baseman's ankle. And I thought it was funny, right? That was my out. And uh, so by this point, sports were uh, a kind of distance, and uh, people just didn't really want me around because I didn't know how to behave properly. And so when that Alateen sponsor said to me, come back next week, I didn't know what to do with that. I'd never been invited back anywhere. And so so we came back next week, and uh, my first sponsor, Carol, and I, and this was prior to the mandate in 2001. I was 16 years old, and I had an adult sponsor. And, uh, and I wouldn't be standing here had I not had an adult sponsor. Because what she did, well, number one, a kid couldn't have handled me. Uh, and number two, what she did for me is she loved me in a way that I'd never been loved in my life right? She loved me through the 12 steps the first time. And, uh, and she said, Sarah, from the beginning, I promise you, if you do what I do, if you do what I do, you can achieve the results I've achieved. And she didn't treat me any differently. This is my pet peeve about Alateen is we treat them like, like, like they're just kids, you know, like they're just somebody special or they're somebody different. And I think what we're missing, we don't understand is they're young members of Al-Anon. And if we keep coddling the program they're going to miss it all together you know what i see in missouri and i can't speak for anywhere else is alateen has becoming a social club and i promise you if it was a social club when i got here i wouldn't be here i didn't need another social club i needed my life to change and that's what my first sponsor gave me she gave me the ability to look at who i was and walk me through that and i knew no matter what i found i would be okay because i trusted her and i believed her and she never left my side, but she she took me through the 12 steps. And, um, you know, Alateen taught me some things that I had never experienced in my life. It, it helped me become other-centered instead of self-centered for the first time. I learned how to care for other people. And uh, she said to me, one of the first things she said to me is she goes, I just need you to know the world goes round and round and it doesn't revolve around you. And I said, well, didn't know that. Um she taught me how to be of service to other people. Um, she, uh, she and her husband, you know, one of the things that I really mourned and um, thought I would never experience was the role of parents. And what I found at 16 years old when I got here, um, <laughs> okay, what I found at 16 years when I got here is that uh, there was some really deep-seated voids and holes in my life and that if I was willing for the package to come in a little bit different wrapping, I could experience those relationships that I never thought I would. And my sponsor and her husband gave that to me, and the people in the district gave me moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. And a lot of those um, deep-seated voids began to heal. Um, I knew... Um, I knew that my sponsor was proud of me. I knew she was proud of me. She always shared that with me. And I never heard that in my home. I mean, my grandma, my grandma, uh, because of her background, uh, she, she thought Al-Anon was a cult, right? That's probably not surprising. 
Her father-in-law's a Pentecostal preacher, and she's a Southern Baptist woman. And she thought that al Nun was a cult. And uh, and I remember being 17 or 18 years old, and I used to call my sponsor all the time. And, um, you know, by the time I got here, there wasn't a lot of feeling. I didn't do any, hardly any feeling. I just was, my feelings were anger. And, and there was two special people in my life. It was my sponsor and a lady from Texas, which I'll talk about in just a second. But my sponsor, um, I, I don't know if she was talking to my grandma or what, but this one time um, I was leaving for a trip. I was 17 or 18, and I had been asked to speak in Birmingham as a as a teen. And, and, and for whatever reason, um, something changed in my grandma. And it wasn't long after that, and she had passed away. But uh, before I left, she said, you know, I don't know what's going on in Alateen, but you've changed. You've changed. And... Um, you know, with our rules and stuff in Alateens today, kids couldn't just get on the road and travel halfway across the country to, to share their story. But whatever happened, I, I'm sure that my sponsor had an opportunity to, to talk to my grandma, and really that was okay then. My sponsor gave her a different perspective of the possibility of what could happen in the program, and uh, and and so that was really cool. Um. You know, I wish I could tell you, like, I had this fantastic rock star program. I become an adult in life. I lived happily ever after. But uh, those of you uh, could probably tell that's not a reality uh, at this point. But but I got incredibly involved in service. Uh, my sponsor told me uh, early on that, you know, like the three-legged stool, service was part of recovery. Service wasn't an option. Service was part of recovery. Um, and I, and I think that's, that, that is a really good message, uh, with the exception or with the caveat that not at the expense of working the steps. And, uh, and I'll get into that. Um, what, what I, what happened to me is I got extremely involved in service and, uh, service become my primary program. And I promise you that can cause a lot of damage. And it certainly did in, in my recovery, um, I eventually graduated high school. Um, one of the things that uh, I didn't tell you in high school is uh, because I got into trouble so much, I had my own cubicle in the ISS room, and uh, I was really proud of that. Uh, I I don't even know why. I mean, I would get into trouble, and I would go to the principal's office, and it got to the point where he would just point. And um, the ISS room was all the way across the other side of the property, and I would take that stroll pretty much on a daily and. Um, by the time high school graduation came around, I had probably been in program for two or three years. And, uh, when, when the principal called my name, he started to cry because he didn't think he would see that. I don't know where he thought that I would be, and I'm not sure where I thought I would be, but, but he started to cry, uh, cause, cause Alateen, uh, had given me something that I hadn't experienced my other years in high school. And I had a whole year without the ISS room. I guess somebody else got my cubicle. Um, um, and so that was really cool. Um, you know, Alateen had given me lots of opportunities in service. Uh, at that point, I had I was speaking uh, across the country, sharing my extreme experience, strength, and hope as a teen. And uh, many people in my area had uh, encouraged me to submit my resume to the WSO to be on the Alateen Advisory Committee. Um, and uh, for a kid like me that uh, had minimal self-worth and uh, my self-worth came from what you thought of me and uh, it was all about obtaining titles and credentials. That was the last thing I probably needed to do. But that's what I did. I submitted my resume and I my resume was selected and so I did that for two years and um, and my ego just really got out of control and um, and my program at that point started to take a back seat and my life became about service. So so I got out of high school. I, I went to school. School wasn't working for me. Um, I don't know, just wasn't working for me because um, there was rules and stuff. And um, and and so I went to work uh, right away. My grandma's health was uh, progressively getting worse. And um, I uh, I started working at a restaurant and was rapidly progressing uh, into management. And one day, um, you know, one of the things I didn't tell you that's actually kind of important is that uh, I found out uh, when I was in my later teen years that my mom was adopted. And I was really pissed about that um, because I felt like it had been hidden from us. And... Um, why am I telling you this right now? 
I don't know. Um, oh, I know. Um, and so I'm working. That's why I'm telling you this. And so uh, after I got over it, one of the things, I never wanted to personally have children. And uh, I wanted to adopt children. I felt like maybe that's how I could give back. Uh, after all, if my mom wasn't, wasn't adopted, I wouldn't have the grandma I had. You know, I wouldn't have had that first angel that I found out in recovery. And so I'm at work one day and I'm managing this restaurant. This man comes in and he orders a happy meal. And I said, well, what kind of happy meal? He goes, you, you're my happy meal. And so then I knew like God had given me this unbelievable gift. Here's this man. He has a son. God had just hooked me up to be like, to fulfill all my dreams that I'd ever thought about. Um, you know, we dated um, for three months, uh, were engaged and married in nine months. And what I can tell you is that I used to think about my mom and my dad, and I used to think of all the things that happened in the active disease of alcoholism. And as a little girl, I used to think, I'll never do those things. I'll never do those things. And uh, what happened in that marriage is I found myself doing things far worse than what I ever witnessed my parents doing. Because you, you see, recovery uh, became less important. And uh, what what became important was surviving in that marriage. And the sad reality is, is uh, you know, I kind of backed off from service and I was going to a local meeting that didn't have a good foundation. And I was telling you all how to work your program. And my life was in shambles. You know, if there's one message I I can touch any of you with tonight is that, you know, recovery doesn't work itself. And uh, there's a guy in one of my groups in uh, St. Louis that talks about, you know, recovery doesn't come through osmosis. <laughs> and um, it just doesn't. Recovery does not come through sitting in a chair. And I spent a lot of years sitting in a chair trying to share the message and I didn't have any idea what I was talking about. Um, there, we've, we've had lots of conversations just in the few days that I have been here in the last 24 hours. And, you know, what I know now with 18 plus years of recovery is it's more imperative that I hit my knees every day now. It's more imperative than what it was in the beginning. Because when I start to think I know that's when I become dangerous. And I need to maintain that conscious contact with the God of my understanding. So anyway, that didn't go well. Uh, lots of domestic abuse and of uh, violence. I, I used to think as a kid uh, with Jerry Springer that, um, you know, that stuff will never happen in my house. Well, it did. You know, I, who watches Jerry Springer at eight years old? You know, that's, that's probably part of the problem, right? And, uh, and I did. I mean, that was just part of the dysfunction in, uh, in our home. And so I'm, I'm going to meetings, um, not working a program, and my life has fallen apart. And uh, there was a series of events happened, and um, I ended up in a house that I couldn't afford, raising my sister, which was, I didn't really talk a lot about that, but my grandma had taken my sister in. My sister was 15 years old, pregnant, trying to get married, um, and it just was another generation being affected by the effects of the disease of alcoholism. And I found myself uh, in this basement uh, one day uh, on my knees, just not sure where to turn, and the phone rang. And, uh, and it was my old sponsor who I had kind of parted ways with because uh, she was trying to tell me what to do um, and stuff like that. Um, and I didn't really want to be told what to do because at that point I knew everything. And, uh, and, and she just said, you know, you can always, you can always call. And again, God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And so um, I had gotten pretty, pretty active um, and involved again uh, in Alan on service. And uh, I certainly wasn't looking. I just got the heck out of a marriage. I certainly didn't want another him. Um, as a result of all the things that went on with sports, I lost a full ride scholarship to play ball due to injury. Um, I got injured my senior year and, and wasn't able to do that. And so uh, once I started to go to meetings together again and I started to get some of that self-worth uh, back and I started to um, live according to our spiritual principles, I knew that I wanted to do something athletically. And so so I started to bowl and, uh, and I was at the bowling alley practicing one day. I was preparing to go to nationals and this woman came down to the bowling alley and said, hey, we need a teammate. Well, that was great for me because I needed somebody to stroke my ego. And, uh, and so I became their teammate and, uh, 
Uh, and I was miserable. I was in the middle of a divorce. And um, they're like, you know, there's some college guys. Like, could you just get laid by a college guy? And I said, you know, I, I'm just really not into that. And uh, I said, don't any of you have any hot sons? Um, I didn't want a husband. I was not what I was looking for. And, and one of them said, as a matter of fact, I do. And, uh, and so, uh, Brian and I started dating and, uh, uh, I went to nationals and ended up getting a scholarship to go back to, uh, to, to school and bowl on a bowling scholarship in St. Louis, which is a miracle. Uh, it's really a miracle of the program because, uh, one of the, one of the, I'm really jumping ahead here when it comes to amends, but one of the things that I used to think in my amends process and my first time through the steps is I'll never find all those people to make amends. And, uh, and I was able to do that, uh, through changing my behavior and my attitudes. And, uh, and I knew that, uh, receiving a, an opportunity to go back on scholarship in a different sport was, was, uh, God's gift to me for figuring out how to make those amends. So, um, so lots of things happen. Um, lots of things happened. Things got really good. Uh, we moved, things got really good with my husband. I, I got really plugged in, uh, into service. And once again, service, uh, kind of ran the forefront of my program. And, uh, and I didn't know what was happening. I, I talked about this a little bit this morning. Um, uh, my, I loved my sponsor, but my sponsor became more like my mom. And, uh, I don't know about any of you, but I don't want my mom telling me what to do. And so that relationship was kind of on the rocks and, and I really wasn't doing a whole lot of listening to anybody. And, uh, I was, uh, this seems like a reoccurring thing cause it kind of is, but I, um, I knew that I needed to do something different. And, uh, one of the things we talked about in the sh workshop earlier was putting people on a pedestal. And, uh, and I certainly had put my sponsor on a pedestal and she fell off and, and I knew it was time to change, but, uh, because I had put her there, I didn't think that there would be anybody that could ever fill that role. And, uh, and so I, I did something drastically different and I went four hours away because, you know, if I tried to get a sponsor like in town, they would know that I was act, not acting right again. So I, uh, went four hours away to try to get a sponsor. Um, and, and I, I was sitting in this meeting one time on a Friday and it was, it's a fantastic meeting. It's probably my favorite meeting in Missouri and Kansas City. And, uh, and I had turned my phone off and I'm not, I'm not making the story up. I promise you, I turned my phone off and all all of a sudden, like, my phone pops back on and it says GPS signal lost. And I'm like, what is going on? And I was humiliated and embarrassed. And I uh, turn it off and it popped back on again. And um, I just didn't know what, what that uh, was about. And um, what, I, what I got from that meeting is that... Um, it was just about total surrender. You know, it was just about total surrender. And because all the conversation became about God, you know, God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And um, I seized resistance to enemies and submitted to their authority. And uh, the steps became really important in that meeting. And, and I just knew that the steps was the answer to <clears throat> to the spiritual gifts that I had experienced at a point in my journey, and and through that, um, I'm going to get into the steps and start start talking about the steps in just a second. But God prevented it, uh, presented an opportunity for me to walk through a series of events that's absolutely changed my life in ways that you know my foundation was great, and thank God for my foundation that I was given in Alatine because as all those things were happening in my life, I at least had that to fall back on. But what I know about the steps is the steps are an ongoing process. You can't just go through them one time. You're not one and done, and that's what I thought. So um, let me get into my notes here. Um, but step one says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And what I learned in step one, uh, again, is that I needed less power, and that it was really okay for my life to be unmanageable. It was in the admitting where my power came from. If I could just admit that my life was unmanageable and that I was a powerless over the effects of alcohol, I could get ready for step two. But I can't get ready for step two unless I can get to that admittance piece um, or that awareness piece. I mean, we talked about that earlier, that, you know, awareness, acceptance, action. I went from awareness to action. 
and I missed the acceptance and the admittance. And so I finally could admit uh, again that my life was unmanageable as a result of the effects of the disease of alcoholism. You know, step two says, uh, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Uh, and this was, this was, uh, really difficult, uh, for me to look at because I had to come up with a power that was bigger than my ego. I had to come up with a power greater than me. And my sponsor said, I don't know what that looks like for you, but the beauty in step two is you get to define it and you get to have this power to be whatever you want it to be. It just has to be bigger than you. And, uh, and so I got to walk through that process and start it, and I got to start defining what this power looked like. Um, and I also had to admit that God could restore me to sanity. You know, there used to be such a negative connotation when I would say God could restore me to sanity, because that meant like I was insane. You all already knew I was insane. I just needed to be able to admit the fact that God could restore me to sanity. And I think the key word in all of that is could. God could restore me to sanity if I get out of the way. And what step two and three both taught me is that there's only one room for one, there's only room for one God and his name isn't Sarah. You know, God can't do God's work if I'm busy playing God. So you get into step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And what I learned about step three right away is that my will and my life are my thoughts and my actions. And that really scared me because my thoughts and my actions is all of me. Could I turn all of me over to this power and knew that and know that I would be okay? And uh, and, I, and I'll share a step three story with you. My my sister uh, had beautiful little girls at this point, and she had decided she wanted to go into the military. And uh, and I still thought I knew everything and thought that was a really bad idea. Um, but she decided she was going to press forward. And there was lots of things that happened. And she ended up on my uh, on my dad and my stepmom's property. By this point, my parents had been long separated. And uh, and and I had a really rocky relationship with my stepmom at the time because uh, drugs were a big part of her story. And uh, I was still pretty rocky in the steps, and and I knew that I I really couldn't participate in that, and and my sister uh, had asked for help, and uh, I woke up one morning and I said, well, you know, I can be of service by getting a U-Haul, and uh, my husband said he could be of service by participating and making the move, and so they did that, and uh, and and we went um, uh, that morning. I. You, you know, when God speaks to you, God's speaking to you. I think if that that's one thing I've learned in the program is that when I have that feeling that God is speaking to me, I need to be very aware. And I don't need to disregard it because something's going on. And I woke up, I just sat up straight in my bed that morning, and God is saying, you need to get in the car and you need to go where they are right now. And uh, and that's what I did. And um, uh, to kind of make a long story short, I had picked my sister up. And, uh, they had loaded the U-Haul and, uh, they had called us and in the midst of the conversation, I heard my, I heard my husband scream bloody murder and then we heard a crash. And honestly, for the next 30 seconds, I didn't know if my husband was dead or alive. But what I knew in step three, this is right in the middle of step three, that it, no matter what would happen, no matter what happened in that accident, that I would be Okay. I knew that I had this higher power and I knew that I had all of you and no matter the outcome that you and God would wrap your arms around me. And if God was really in charge of my life, I would be okay. As it turned out, my, my husband was okay. And, uh, my sister's boyfriend, uh, at the time was okay. Uh, but a lady had a heart attack and crossed the center line and hit him head on. And, uh, and it was the most horrific scene I've ever seen in my entire life. And, uh, our relationship was pretty rocky at that point. And, um, you know, just walking through that, letting God be in charge of my life, taking care of my will and my life solidified the fact that, uh, that life is really short and I need to live it one day at a time. And I just need to be in the moment. You know, step four talks about uh, making a searching and fearless moral inventory. And um, and I think the key words there are searching and fearless uh, and, and moral. And uh, I like to break things down. And in step four, I need to fear less. I just need to do the work. And there's so many ways to do step four. I've done, I mean, I've done, uh, I've told my life story. There's, you can go through the path of recovery. But uh, the most effective way that I've worked step four is I've done the columns. 
And, uh, and I realize that's not necessarily in our literature, so I'm not going to get into that into detail, but the, the, uh, I, I add a column and, uh, by the time I get to the last column, I identify what my part is. What's my part? What's my part? What's my part? And when I get into my part, I start to see patterns. And when there's patterns, I can change my behavior. But if I can't identify what the patterns are, I don't know what to change. Uh, and my sponsor at the time said, Sarah, the whole idea with finding your part is now you can behave your way into new, a new reality. Right? If I know what to change, I can change my behaviors and create a new reality. And uh, so that started to happen with step four. As I got into step five, it says, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Um, and I still, I still had this God complex and, um, what I, what I was still doing was trying to seek approval from you. I could tell you anything in the world about my step five. It could tell you about a sex inventory. It could just tell you about all these things before I could talk to the God of my understanding. Cause I needed your approval. Uh, that's what I thought. I thought I needed your approval and I was afraid of this God. The real approval I needed was to get right with God and so uh, what I love about step five today is that uh, it's written in order for a reason. When I admit those things, I need to admit to God, to myself, and another human being. And because uh, when I've admitted it with God, I'm right with God. I'm right with myself. And then I can tell you with no reservations what's going on in my life. And, and I experienced that through a step five at a park one day. Uh, and I was, and I was, went to the park and I'm revealing this step five and I'm not worried about what's going on around me. And when I got up from that step five, I felt this unbelievable peace and this unbelievable power and this unbelievable freedom. And I knew I finally was right with God because I admitted that step five to God, uh, in the first place. Um, you know, step six uh, talks about being entirely ready to remove these defects of character. And uh, based on my background and all the shortcomings that were identified in my step four, I thought in the step six that if I became ready for all those things to be removed, there would be nothing left. I didn't understand that that God would remove those things in time and that as God removed those one at a time, they would be replaced with character assets, right? I also didn't understand that some of those defects were assets. They were just out of balance. And so I think step six is really like an amazing process of becoming ready. How do you become ready? And I can tell you in my first six, my sponsor said, okay, become ready and pray. Five minutes later, I was ready to go, right? Step six is not a five-minute process. It happens over time. Uh, and it's only through prayer and meditation that that process happens. And I don't get to dictate in step seven when them shortcomings are removed. You know, and that's what I thought. I thought I could just wake up one day and say, okay, God, I'm ready for this ego to be gone. And it just doesn't work like that. And so step seven talks about humbly asking him to remove our shortcomings. And and I just didn't understand what what humbly meant. I didn't understand humility. And I remember in the beginning of my recovery, I, I, uh, I used to call my first sponsor and say, I think I found some humility. And she said, Sarah, if you found humility, you wouldn't be calling click, <laughs> you know? And so this time in step seven, I, I found somebody different and I said, well, what, what is humility? What is humility? And she, Sarah, she said, Sarah, it's just as simple as accepting yourself as you are. No more, no less. And so when I get to step seven and I start to pray, when I go into it with that mindset, God, please remove these shortcomings, but I'm good with who I am. You know, it's just a different perspective. And, um, and again, the defects are removed over time. Sometimes I want the defects gone right now. But my name's not God, and sometimes I'm not ready for those defects to be gone. And and what I know is that when I'm praying about a defect, it shows up over and over and over and over till I'm entirely ready for that to, to be let go. God continues to present it. Um, you know, step eight. Uh, talks about making a list and becoming willing to make amends to them all. And, you know, my sponsor kind of tricked me back then. Um, she had me make the three columns, yes, no, and no way in hell. And uh, she said we could start with the no way in hell. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Um, and really my step eight, in the my first step eight, I did the best I could uh, with what I had. But, you know, I think the key in step eight is is, again, about becoming ready. 
are becoming willing to make those amends. And uh, I know today, regardless of what column I put those people in or what approach you want to take, that I, I'm I'm willing, but I don't get to dictate when those amends happen. Um, so, um, you know, my sponsor and I go back and forth about about what does that mean. And so uh, when I'm at my best, at my spiritual best, I can take some names off my eight-step list and I can pray daily and ask God to help me become willing to make make amends to those people. And, uh, and I know that, uh, I know that God, God does do that. And, um, sometimes I'll just be out and from way back when somebody on that no way in hell list just pops up. It's because I've done the work and I can make that right and not be held hostage by the past. Um, step nine, uh, is one of my more recent, uh, favorite steps that, it talks about making direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And I think the key, the key in step nine is direct. It says make direct amends. And uh, I know my family got tired of hearing Sarah say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry is not an amends. You know, I'm sorry is an apology, and that certainly can be part of an amends. But, you know, what I've learned in, uh, in step nine is that an amends is I'm wrong. I was wrong. And uh, how can I make it right? And, um, you know, I had a couple uh, lingering amends. Um, you know, when my grandma got really sick, I I got busy finding boys. And uh, my mom and uh, her girlfriend, she had left my dad and, and had a girlfriend, uh, had moved in. And, and it was too painful to watch. And so I missed the last uh, days of my grandma's life because I was full of resentment. And uh, in my first ninth step, I went to the cemetery and I read a letter and the wind took it away and I I felt some relief. But uh, I always had this lingering thing like it was just the best I could do at a time at the time with the amends. And uh, and so so over time, I kept praying that um, that God, whatever, whatever you want me to do, just let me know. And uh, so recently I've changed careers a couple years ago and uh and this actually happened last month. I, uh, I had an opportunity. There's, there was a man that, uh, is a fantastic spiritual man in Al-Anon and St. Louis. And, uh, he actually is probably the most spiritual man I've ever met in Al-Anon, 90 something years old. And, and everybody loved him. And he ended up getting, uh, cancer, uh, in the tongue and he could hardly converse. And, uh, he didn't want anybody around. And I didn't have that kind of relationship, but, uh, with him, but based on my career, uh, I, I run an operation that provides services to people and, uh, and they had called and uh, al -Anon people had called and said, Hey, could you, uh, could you go over and talk to him and see if you can provide any services for him? Uh, and he let me in and, and I sat down one day and I just said, I, uh, I won't say his name. I just said, well, how are you? How are you today? And he said, Sarah, he said, I'm just powerless. 92 years old dying with cancer and accepted his powerlessness. And yet I fight and I fight and I fight in step one, trying not to be powerless uh, time after time and again. And I said, well, I said, really? And I said, he said, yeah. And, and, uh, and we continued to talk and, um, so we worked out the deal and we took care of them and I went back the next time and I, uh, I make the confirmation calls from my office and I wasn't going to go back and he answered the phone and, uh, he said, I'll see you tomorrow. Now my job isn't to go out and provide the services. I'm the manager. And, uh, and so I knew that I needed to go and I, I didn't know why I needed to go again. God was speaking and, and, uh, you know, I have struggled over the years with, do I really have the ability to love people? Do I really have the ability to truly deeply love? And so I went over there and, uh, and he started to talk to me and he, we shared some really good sentiments and, uh, he talked as long as he could and I started to get emotional and I knew it was time for me to go. Um, cause God forbid somebody see me cry. My team, my employees were in there. I didn't want them to see me cry. I don't know what that was all about. Um, but anyway, I knew it was time for me to go and, and I started to walk away and, uh, and he, and I turned around and he raised his hand like a superhero and he said, Sarah, your job's to carry on my love. And I knew in that moment, that was my final amends to my grandma. That's all my grandma wanted me to do was to carry on the love, but I never thought I was capable. 
And out of all the Al Anon people in St. Louis, I'm the one person that got to watch this man make his transition. The next day, he passed away. And so when I have that conscious contact with God, sometimes I don't have to necessarily book an appointment. I just need to show up. I just need to follow God's guidance. Um, you know, step 10 talks about um, continuing to take inventory in when we're wrong, promptly admitting it. Uh, again, that's probably why I was doing a four-step in my room just a few hours ago, um, because I had done some things and uh, I needed to promptly admit it in and, and take care of that. And uh, thank God that it's not all compiled like it used to be. You know, I get to clean the wreckage of the day and not be held hostage by all that stuff. I get to be free every day at the end of the day if I choose to. Step 11 talks about um, having a conscious contact with God and praying for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And I think the, the, the key for me is is knowledge of his will, not knowledge of Sarah's will. You know, I I I used to get that confused and... Uh, knowledge of his will means that I, I feel okay when I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And when I'm in the midst of taking actions, if it doesn't feel right, it's probably not God's will. And the difference is I know that today. I used to just push through it and do whatever I wanted to do. And when I have that conscious contact with God, I feel okay as I progress through if it's God's will. Uh, and the beauty is if it's not, there's other steps that get, get, get to clean it up. And, um, step 12 talk, talks about, uh, having had a spiritual awakening, uh, as a result of these steps, we get to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all of our affairs. And there's one, uh, key word in this step that, uh, that I chose to ignore for a long time. And that's all. It doesn't say some. I spent years being some of the some, Right. It says all of our affairs. That means my family. That means Al-Anon. That means everything that I am privileged uh, to belong in. That means inside the service structure. I'll close with one last story, and um, I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Um, those of you that were uh, at the workshop earlier, I had talked about briefly how I had caused harm in the service structure. And um, and I had received a letter from a member, and if you'd like to read it in part, it is in the World Service Conference Summary. I had received a letter um, that talked about be my behavior and that if I wanted to be part of the solution to try to carry love and uh, not gossip and criticize. And that letter ate my lunch for about four years. And, uh, and frankly, it pissed me off when I got it. Um, but it ate my lunch and over time it started to work on me. And, and I started to accept the fact that that letter was a loving letter. It was truly a loving letter. If somebody had enough courage to, to send me a letter that challenged me to be part of the solution, it was truly loving. And it was an anonymous letter. And over time, I started to pray, and I started to pray, and I started to pray that, God, please, just let me know who, who wrote the letter so I can make it right. And that's all I wanted to do was make it right. And one day I found myself sitting across from this woman at a convention, and we were having this conversation, and I said, you know, I need to tell you something. She goes, no, I need to tell you something. And, and she said, I wrote the letter. <laughs> so she had no reason to say that to me, except for I'd made this conscious contact with the God of my understanding, and I just wanted to make it right. And she said, why? And I said, all I've wanted to do for the last three years is just say thank you. Right? The first word and the first step is we. And I can't do it uh, without any of you, and I certainly can't do it without all the people uh, in my life that continue to guide me and love me and support me. You know, Al-Anon has, has given me unbelievable gifts. I, uh, I raised my... 16, my 16 year old nephew, we got him when he was nine. He's a member of Alateen. My husband and I have been married for almost 10 years, which is truly a miracle. And uh, I have the most beautiful family in the world that when I, I used to call my nieces when they were a little younger and, and, and they would say, uh, Aunt Sarah, I love you 10, right? Because 10 is as high as they could count. <laughs> and, uh, and I promise you there was a point in my life where no one would answer the phone. I guess the last thing I'll share is that um, um, service is a phenomenal thing. 
And uh, I have absolutely loved every second of being the delegate. Um, but we can't do service at the expense of not working the steps. You know, service is not the program. The, t- the 12 steps are the program of al And when I can get connected with the God of my understanding and walk through those 12 steps, there is not one thing in my life that there's not a solution to. So uh, as I shared earlier, it is, uh, it's always humbling. It's always an honor and privilege to be of service. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me. You know, recovery has given me the ability to live. Thanks again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.